Good morning, Calvary Baptist Church. As you can see, I'm recording this on Valentine's Day. I do hope you had an amazing Valentine's Day and love was spread all around. But now it's Sunday, Valentine's Day out the window. Time for some announcements. So listen up, here they come. Tomorrow, the church office is going to be closed for President's Day. So hopefully you'll have a good day off. If not, you'll have a good day at work. But the church is going to be closed for President's Day. If you've been to the church over the past few weeks, you realize we've been trying to do some security updates. Maybe you've pulled on the door and it hasn't opened, and maybe you've pulled on the door and it has. We're working through it, but here's a couple of things you might want to remember. If you see my pickup or John's car here at the church, it's pretty sure the door is going to be unlocked. But if you don't see our vehicles here, you're pretty sure the door is going to be locked. So take care on pulling the door or just ring the doorbell and Carol will be able to help you. Out there in the foyer right next to the Welcome Center is a big old tub with some accessories for Operation Christmas Child. It has some sunglasses and some ball caps and some, some costume jewelry. It's for all these kids around the world that we're going to be collecting throughout the months before we get to the big pack the box day. So if you can go get some accessories, bring it back to the tub, let's fill this tub to overflowing for Operation Christmas Child. Believe it or not, it's almost time for Game On VBS. There's a sign-up sheet right out there on the Welcome Center. We'd love for you to sign up and say, I want to be part of Game On VBS. There is something for everyone to do. So walk out there after service, sign up, and Lacey will be able to contact you and tell you what she needs you to do for VBS in June. That's all the announcements we have for you this morning. Hope you got them all down. If not, check our website, read the bulletin. It's time for worship. God bless. We updated some security, right? But I want to say to you, so our security from God, right? So we need to security more from the devil. We just stand and we we'll welcome each other and say that God loves you and so do I. I love you. We need to say, open up the heaven, open up the heavens. We already enjoyed this last week, so hopefully you can enjoy these songs again. We were we waiting for this day. We waited for this day. We gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening in desire. Present in this place, we have glory on our face, looking to the sky. Listening like the cloud, you're standing with us now, Lord, unveil our eyes. You're the reason. You're the reason we hear. You're the reason we sing. Open up there. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the heavens, 
We want to see you open up the floodgates of mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our prayer. Show us, Lord. Show us. Show us your glory. Show us. Show us your power. Show us. Show us your glory. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Open up the heavens. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part. The heavens, we want to see you open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our prayer. Can you sing one more time? Open up the heavens, Lord. Open up the heavens, we want to see you open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our prayer. Lord, that's your prayer. Amen. You may be said. Amen. Woo. Hey, it's good to be back. I know Dr. Che has been traveling around a mile or two, and I was out of town doing a little wedding last week, but it's good to be back in the Lord's house. Just a couple of extra reminders about Operation Christmas Child. We have a little saint up here named Joanne said, if you throw a little money towards her, she'll be happy to shop for those accessories for you. And so she'll be happy to go up to Lubbock, buy her a couple outfits, go, oh, <laughs> lucky Kevin. But anyways, if you can't get to Lubbock or can't find accessories, Joanne said she'd love to help you out and get that tub overflowing. And it's just an easier thing to do throughout the year, filling these tubs up, and then come October, November, we'll have everything we need to pack them and, and get them all, all around the world. So think about that. Joanne's here, love to take that. Also, uh, Texas Boys and Girls Ranch has contacted us and we do an offering for them, but they're really in some need of some accessories. They need some um, body soap and some detergent. That's H-E. I don't know. Maybe it's just for he. I don't know. Not for her. Maybe. Oh, high, high efficiency. Well, there you go. <laughs> high efficiency detergent. But if you could do that, they'd be greatly blessed as well. So lots going on. I know there's a lot of sickness out there. Uh, Kim's home, sick with the flu, and so I, I'm good. I Purell myself, took a Purell shower, and had some Purell on my toast, and I'm good. So, uh, but let me just ask your name, Marjorie Stoneman. How many of y'all have heard of Marjorie Stoneman? Mm, I didn't hear about Marjorie Stoneman until last week. What about Parkland, Florida? Yeah. Well, Marjorie Stoneman High School in Parkland, Florida. You know, it's it's a world we live in, folks. It's a world we live in of evil. And that doesn't mean as whether it's a church shooting or a school, school shooting that we stay, keep our kids away from school, that we stay out of church, that we have to once again trust in the Lord with all of our heart. And lean not on our understanding. We can't make sense out of a 19-year-old buying a gun and going and killing some people. Can't make no sense out of it. But what we can do is pray to God for those who are, who are screaming. that This is the, if I hear you're, you're in our, we're in your thoughts and prayers one more time, well, what else can we do but pray? Because there is power in prayer. And so we are going to lift up Marjorie Stoneman High School right now. Father, we do come before you, and we, we do pray. And they are in our thoughts and prayers. There's 17 funerals for children age 14 to, to 37-year-old teacher that, that's lives were taken from them. But they were taken, I pray, that will give glory to you, for life is not guaranteed. Your word tells us that we are be to, to be prepared. We're not given the next breath. We're not given the next day. So this morning, Father, as we are in your house and we feel safe and secure, we don't know what this day holds, but we are praying to the one who holds the day. And we are going to worship to you. We are not going to curse as others are. We are not going to scream. We are going to pray to you that you are still on your throne and you are still in control of all that happens on this planet. 
So your mercy and your comforter be over Parkland, Florida and in those school halls. That you would be seen great and mighty. That someone would know who you are. That they would give their life to you. We ask in your name. Amen. We'll be down here, Dr. Che and I, as well, praying. You're welcome to join us. We would invite you to reach out to one another. To pray. To ask God that he would open your heart to see what's in there. And maybe that void is him not being there. So let's go before the Lord right now in prayer. Father, our Lord, and our Master, we just come to you, Father, just thanking you so much for this day and the blessings that you've given each of us. Father, we just want to thank you for Calvary Baptist Church and for what it means to us. And Father, just want to thank you for our staff. And Father, I just want to come to you now, Father, just lifting our nation up to you. And just ask that you'll just keep your hand upon our nation, Father, and, and just continue to bless our nation. And just be with our president and vice president, Father, just give them the wisdom and knowledge that they need to make all the right decisions. <clears throat> and Father, we just come to you now just asking that you'll just uh, be with our first responders and our military, Father. Wherever they're at, Father, we just ask that you'll just keep them safe and that no harm will come to them. And, Father, I just want to come to you, Father, just asking that you'll just be with the ones in Parkland, Florida, Father. I just ask that you'll just be with the families there that's lost loved ones. We just ask that you'll just draw them a little closer to you and just comfort their heart. And, Father, I just come to you just lifting Dr. Che up to you, Father, and Shree, and just asking, Father, that the music do nothing but just honor and glorify you. And, Father, I just lift my brother Steve up to you and ask that you'll just hide him behind the cross and just lay on his heart what you would have him to say. And, Father, I just ask that you'll just uh, be with the ones that's in the nursing home and homebound. Father, we just ask that that you'll just continue to keep your healing hand upon them and nothing but your will be done in their life. And Father, I just ask that if there's one here that needs to make a decision, whatever that decision is, Father, we just ask that they make it before it's too late. Go with us now, Father, through the rest of this day. Forgive us of our sins. I ask these and all of the blessings for Christ's sake. Amen. Hey children, come on down. No, there's a few of you out there. Hey, hey Kara, she made it. Is this all? Is everybody? No, nope. oh, nope, here comes one more. Here he comes. Here he goes. Hey, baby. Okay, good morning. <laughs> so, this is kind of the month of, I guess what we'd say, love, because we just had valentine's day right so there's lots of flowers and chocolates and all this stuff that's been purchased and given out to everybody right so we've all had that well tuesday night as i went to the store before valentine's day i noticed that one of the stores out there they had put up this huge large tent just to sell the flowers and chocolate out of for the next day and i'm thinking wow that's a lot of money a lot of bond a lot of flowers a lot of chocolate well, then I got to thinking, I went to Mr. Webster, I actually Googled it, and I looked up the definition of love. And Mr. Webster says, an intense feeling of deep affection, a person or thing that loves one, that loves one another, and it's also a score in a tennis match. Don't ask me about that, I don't play tennis. So, <clears throat> then I got to Googling, 
And this here is our guidebook, right? It's God's Word. My granny called it the good book. And if the good book said it, it was so. And in this one alone, the word love is mentioned 551 times. So if we follow this book, it tells us a lot about love, doesn't it? One of the verses, the very first one I read, and I think it's both very important, and we all know it, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that really made me think, because he's just freely throwing his love at us. Okay? It says the world. That means every human being from the beginning of time to the end of time is given this love. He's just throwing it at us. Are we taking it? Are we bringing it to us? Okay, because it's just there. He's not asking us to pay for it in any way. He's just saying, take it. It also says in 1 Corinthians 16, for do everything in love. Whether it's making our bed or carrying out the trash when we don't want to. And 1 John 4, 19 says we love because he first loved us. This one's really kind of hard for me. Matthew 5, 44. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who prosecute you. Even when someone hurts us, we still have to show them love. Okay? So I just pray that you accept God's love and that we share God's love each and every day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the love that you just throw at us, Lord. And I just ask that each and every one of us accept it. And that after we accept it, that we share it. I ask that you bless these children, Lord, in their homes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a place for you, every single person. This is here. That's why we are singing. So many play, so many reasons we are singing. Can we sing it together? This is the why we singing. Would you stand? Show his power and mind. That's why we pray. 
my song, my song must sing. My song, my song must sing. My song, my song, my song must sing. Beautiful one, my song, my song, my song must sing. My song, my song must sing. My song, my song must sing. Beautiful one, beautiful one, I love. Beautiful one, I adore. Beautiful one, my soul must sing. This is God gave to us for the scripture reading for us. Psalm thirty. All together, I will glory, glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. All together again, glory the Lord with me. Let us exalt His name together. Amen. One of the powerful things, the cross. Any time when I sing, this is the. When I survey the wondrous cross on which a prince of glory died, my richest gain. Special music for you.
Who are you? What is your identity? And what voices are you listening to? Let me explain. Do you ever find yourself saying, Ah, you are such a loser. You're a fraud, a, a failure. You don't have what it takes, you're just too stupid. Or you might look in the mirror and say, Wow, I am such an ugly person. Let me ask you, do you think that that's the voice of the Almighty God that you're hearing? Or is it the voice of someone else? Now I want you to listen closely to what the Word of God says about the core of who you are. Your identity. Now the Bible says you belong to the King. You are a child of the King. You are a disciple of the King. It says you may approach the King with freedom and confidence. You have direct access to the throne of the King. In fact, it says you are seated with Him in the heavenly realm. That you are made righteous by the King. That you are loved by the King. Do you understand that? That the Sovereign King accepts you. He has befriended you. He has chosen you. He has completed you. Nothing you can think of can define His infinite love for you. You are adopted as His child. It says that you are united with Him. That you will spend eternity in His presence. Do you realize the fullness of what that means? You have been given everything you need for life and for godliness. You are a citizen of His kingdom. You are healed by Him. You are hidden in Him. You are defended by Him. You are guided in Him. You are one with His Spirit. And listen to this. You have not been given the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. Do you understand that? Nothing can separate you from Him. Nothing! That's not all. Oh, it goes on and on and on and on. You are established. You are anointed. You are His workmanship. You are sealed through Him. You are saved by Him. You are sanctified. You are justified. You have been redeemed by the King. He has cleansed you. He has bought you. You can't be forgiven of sin without Him. And you can't be freed from condemnation outside of Him. You were buried and baptized into His death. And you were raised with Him into new life. His death is your death. His life is your life. You are made alive by the King. So listen. Don't cheat us of your contribution by living a life based on an unhealthy self-perspective. Give us what you've got. Give us the new creation that you are. You are a new creation in Christ. A new creation. Ooh. Honestly, I was just going to say amen and have an invitation. Because that video there says it all in this talk today about who defines me. That's who defines you. That's who defines you is the guy who says that right there. The God who sent his one and only son that you would that hang on the cross. You. That's who defines you. There's a world out there that wants to define you. But we don't serve the world. We serve the creator of the world. That's who defines you. We've been taking a journey of identity crisis. Who defines me? Growing up, I, I wasn't always this good looking. I was a squirrely, scrawny, long haired, yes, I, I was, California beach bummer. And then I grew up and the hair grew out, and this is who you get. And the world will tell me I'm a failure, I'm a loser because I don't look like a preacher, I didn't go to preacher school, I don't have sheepskin hanging off my office room anywhere, but God defines me. God called me, believe me, and, and there's still the deep marks in the ground where I came and he drugged me and drugged me and drugged me because I didn't want to come because you got the wrong guy, God. So who defines you? Have you let the world define you? And think about this. We've been going along this journey about our names and our identity. I've got some mirrors here. and Some of us like to look in them a lot. And some of us don't like to look at them at all. But that's who you are. 
And I don't know why you won't claim ownership in who you are. So many of us are spending thousands and thousands on who we think we need to be instead of who God created us to be. So I did the research on nicknames. Nicknames. I did not know this. Nickname was created because back in the day, your name was your private property. And if you gave somebody authority to say your name, that's the only way they could say your name because your name was your private. You owned that name. And so other people didn't want to go, uh. And so they gave you a nickname. Many people here have middle names or created from an extra name because you weren't given the permission to say your first name. Let me throw some nicknames out. Maybe you'll know them. How about Elvis Presley was known as the king. Thank you. Thank you very much. Michael Jordan was known as Air Jordan. Here's a good one. William Bonnie. Billy the Kid. Lou Ferrigno. Oh, yes. I did some research on Lou Ferrigno. Interesting story about him. He's in a movie called Pumping Iron, and then they did a biographical interview with him, and this is what he said. Uh, just real quick, he was born in 51 in Brooklyn, New York. He was born with a hearing disability. That's why he talks kind of slurred and, and deep. Uh, there wasn't much about Lou. His dad was embarrassed by his own son because he had a hearing disability until his own son started lifting weights. And his dad, seeing that his son could become something, started owning up to, that's my son, I want to be his manager, I want to be his trainer. And Lou's dad started training him, and, training him into bodybuilding, and Lou became very big, as we know. And the very first competition against Arnold Schwarzenegger was the Mr. Universe contest. Lou and Arnold. And they did their pose down, their pose off, their posing and everything, and and Arnold won. And as Lou was walking off the stage, his dad ran up to him and looked him in the face and said, You're a loser. Get your stuff out of my house. You're no longer welcome. His son hadn't even gotten off the stage. And his dad defined him as a loser in his first competition ever. We know Lou went on to have a great career as the Hulk became a very well-known person. I can't imagine me running up to my daughters or grandchildren or, or anybody at the first time you've ever done anything and say, uh, you're a loser. But let me tell you, the world defines this. If you don't hit it spot on every single time, you're a loser. So I went back to the names. I went back to who defines you. Nicknames. So I sent it out to the connection. Some of you replied. Here's some nicknames of your people in the church. Some of you might easily know these people. I'll just say the nickname. There's Chucky. There's Thumper. There's Biker Babe JJ. There's Sister. There's Honey. That's a tough one. I like this one. There's Megatron or Megaroni. There's, oh, I like this one, Joey, or Pumpkin, or Droopy Drawers, <laughs> Grandpa Buddha, or Grandpa uh, Baloo, I like those. How about this one, Frito, Turtle, Munchkin, Papa Smurf, Giant, oh, here's a toughie, Coach Mac, Muffin, Cindy Nay. Chad Mutt, J-Baby, Codeman, or Bear. One guy's nickname was Stud, but he was embarrassed to say it, so I said it for him. He said, that's his football name. But you think about nicknames. You think about how they identify you. I don't know if you have a nickname or not. But in the story we're talking about today, I'm in Old Testament 2 Samuel this morning in chapter 9. And there's a name in there that let me tell you folks, I walked around the church all this past week saying that name because it's one of those names that should have been John or should have been Pete or Mike. But it wasn't none of those. 
It was a very hard name, so we're going to take a journey here through this. I'm going to enunciate it how I plan to enunciate it all this week. If you enunciate it differently, good for you. Here we go. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. And we're going to take a quick stroll through here. David asked, Is there anyone left in the house of Saul whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? There is a servant of Saul's house, household named Ziba. That's not the name. They summoned him to appear before David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, Is there anyone, to, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered, There is still a, a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he? The king asked, Ziba answered, He is at the house of Machir, son of Amamil in Lodabar. Those weren't hardy either. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Machir, son of Amamil. When, here we go, Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul. So Mephibosheth was Jonathan's son and Granddad is Saul, King Saul. So he's got some legacy here. Came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and all and will always, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? I'm going to pause here. We've got a few more verses. The king called Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth's dad was Jonathan. His granddad was King Saul. He had some legacy. I'm wondering who has defined you. That you think so little of yourself. That you don't walk upright. You don't hold your head up high. You don't believe that you're a child of the king. I wonder who's defined you. Who's ridiculed you. Who's put you in your place. Who's mocked you. Because that's what happened to Mephibosheth. Now no doubt, I was working on this writing here and I said, You know what, Lord, I, I think I need, need to nickname him. Because I just can't walk around all day calling him Mephibosheth. I think I'm just, I could call him M. That's just kind of hollow, isn't it? Then I was going to call him Fibbo. Well, that sounded like Fibber. So let's call him a liar. So let's just stick with Mephibosheth. How about you help me out? One, two, three. Yeah, just right. Not that easy, is it? But you think about this. You think even a name. My, on my birth certificate, Stephen, not with a P-H, but with an N at the end, is Stephen George Carter. I was named after my St. Stephen in the Bible. I was named after my granddad who farms out in Missouri. That's my legacy. And I can't tell you how many times it was P-H-E-N, Stephen, Stefano, Stefan. No, just, just call me Steve. I'll even drop the N, make it easier. So Steve, Steve-o! What about your name? Have you allowed those people in your life to define you, to mock you, to ridicule you? Have you forgotten that when God said, I fearfully, wonderfully created you, He meant it? What, what's happened to your body posture over the past few years because you've oopsed? You, you've had a stumble in life. You might be stumbling in life today. And you've somehow done something, are doing something, thinking about doing something. Don't think you can be forgiven for something. Who's defined you? That video said it all. You have been defined by the king. You have a place at his table. He has redeemed you with his blood. Why would we walk anything less than upright and honorable why to be, well, I'm not worthy. I'm just a low down, no good for nothing. I'm going to whip myself. I think I need to sit in the back because I ain't worthy to sit in the front. I think I need to come late and leave early. 
Because Mephibosheth said the same thing. Why would you even notice me? Like a dead dog. Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. Holy moly. And Mephibosheth's grandson of your master will sit at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Mekir. And all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth uh, lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. Two times it was mentioned he was lame in both feet. A little side note on that was, as the wars were going on and Jonathan and Saul were engaged in battle and were killed in the battle and the enemy was coming, a nurse housemaid picked up Mephibosheth when he was five and was running with him and dropped him, breaking both of his ankles. He was crippled. Can I ask you what's crippled you? Because that's what I asked Steve as I was learning that he was crippled. How, how could you even look at a dead dog like me? I'm crippled. Maybe, maybe you're bald and you think, I, can't, be, I be, can't become a worldly person. I don't know how to pray. I can't become a pastor because I'm bald. Or maybe I'm big or maybe I'm skinny or maybe I'm young or maybe I'm old or maybe I'm white or maybe I'm black or brown. Or... What's crippled you? Maybe it's money. Maybe it's marriage. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's that, that demon in your head that's got into your mind and tells you that your mind isn't worth paying any attention to, that you're out of your mind. You're a child of the King. That's who defines you. You have been fearfully and wonderfully created. You have been are, are being loved and will be loved with an everlasting love. Just real quick, if, if you have the right to condemn somebody, raise your hand. Just like over in Parkland, Florida, the condemnation of God. What kind of God would allow? I don't have an answer because that's a God question. God is the only one with that answer. I don't know why He allowed, but it passed by Him. He doesn't allow anything to happen unless it passes by Him. He's God. He's in control. And for whatever the reason... He chose that 17 lives needed to end that day, and they ended. And maybe it's to bring stronger security. Maybe it's to bring whatever we need to bring to draw attention. I don't think a 19-year-old kid should be able to, to, to buy a weapon like that. 21. 20 was the adult age. That's just my opinion. Maybe it's to show the, the gaps in our security. Maybe when you come to the church and you pull the door and you grumble and you got to wait three seconds for the buzzer to work. You're like, oh! That's why we have it now. Because we don't do church like we used to do church. We, we've got to see things differently. Every time you look in the mirror every morning, you see a different you. You're one day older. And so I, I wonder what you see when you look in those mirrors. What do you see when you look in the mirror? Do, do you see the strong marriage that you have and the strong husband and wife that you are? Do you see the strong relationship you have with your children and grandchildren and friends? Do you just look at how broke you are? How crippled you are? Do you want, moan and wail over the circumstance of my health? Do you see a tattered, worn person? Do you see a person who exemplifies Christ? Who do you see when you look in the mirror? Does the person in the mirror define who you are? Because I don't care how good you polish up. It's what we show up and say up that tells others who we are. It tells others who we are. Mephibosheth was one of those guys that, I'm crippled. 
I'm crippled. How can you even look at me, King David? I'm crippled. His physical disability is what he said he defined himself by. You can't use me. I can't sit at your table. I'm crippled. How many times have you come and sat in that pew burdened, broken, on the verge of just a tear coming out? And you're like, I, I'm not going to go down. And, and if I were to walk by that pew after the service is over, I'd see your, your imprint of your hand still on that pew. And I, I, I want to remind you, I think we'd be less than wise if we think every soul that walks in here is right with God. And yet sometimes we are frozen by what other people see us as. Yeah, I'm middle-aged, could lose a few pounds, could get more sleep, could eat better. But when I got up this morning, I was happy to be alive. I was happy that I was walking through my house. I was moving my arms to get clothed. I could still brush my teeth. I still have my brain that thinks of good thoughts. And so that's what I'm defining myself today as. One of those that says, but I've called you. I have called you. And I think so many times in our lives when we've been called by God, we start out with, who am I? Why would you? Why would you look at me? I don't speak like a Texan. How could you call me with this, with this strange accent to be your servant? But you know what Dr. Hyun Che said? Here am I, Lord. Send me. And here he is in Brownfield, America. Because he said, I'm not going to let my dialect cripple me. I'm not going to let my glasses cripple me. Or my hair, or my posture, or my clothing, or lack of intelligence. Because I don't have all those lofty theological words to say. Cripple me. I think the church is becoming crippled because the church body feels they're crippled. King David said, Mephibosheth, come and sit at my table for the rest of your days. I'm giving you everything back that your granddad had. And what did Mephibosheth do for that? Nothing. He, you know, let me tell you about Lodabar, where he was at. It was on the east side of the Jordan, which is the non-blessed side of the Jordan. There were no blessings. I went to a little place down south here called... It's down by Trilingua, Lahitas. I think it's what dirt sits on. It is bare. It's like 50 shades of beige. And people are like, oh my gosh, it's the most beautiful I've ever seen. Well, I, I couldn't see nothing but broken sticks, rocks. I couldn't even see a Gila monster. It didn't want to be there. Now, people love it. It had a golf course that's, I guess, just to die for, but I'm not a golfer, so I didn't die. But people are like, oh my gosh, did you love it? No. No. But I went down there, and you know what? It was a different scenery. God's glory was still there. His presence was still felt. It was an amazing journey because I learned so much. I wasn't crippled by exploring and seeing. Just, just you know, I thought as I age, my, my feet get heavy. I don't know about yours, but I've stumbled a time or two. Anybody ever stumble? Anybody ever stumped their toe? Whoop, didn't see that. And then all of a sudden, the worst is worse. Well, people laugh. <laughs> Can't pick your feet up, huh? <laughs> we're, we're all going to stumble. Let me just tell you, church, as much as I love you, don't let anybody cripple you. Don't let anybody cripple you by the way you look, the way you talk, what vehicle you drove or how you walked in here by your ethnicity, by your financial, by your relational. Don't let anybody cripple you. That video, I'll send it out to you if you want. That video is a reminder that you are a child of the king. I crippled myself. Mephibosheth didn't cripple himself. He was dropped as a child and he was crippled. But he allowed that crippling to cripple his life. I wonder this morning, as, as we kind of wrap up here, there are crippling diseases out there. There's cancers and there's other things. that There's despair and depression and alcoholism and drug addiction. There's our past that cripples us.
can I remind you there's a Christ who redeemed us. There's a past that might have crippled you, but there's a Christ that says, I want to redeem you today. My blood cleansed you. You have been cleansed. You are my child. I, I have set a place for you at my table. Mephibosheth said, but I'm crippled. Why would you even look at me like you were looking at a dead dog? If you're here this morning, you're not dead. I don't know where your spiritual destination is. Only you do. I don't know where your wants and desires are. Only you do. You might be burdened today. You might have a family burden. You might have a financial burden. You might have a relational burden. Don't let that cripple you from being less than what Christ created you to be. Don't let that cripple you. Christ created you. He is ready to show you amazing, wondrous things that He can't even tell you of them because you wouldn't believe Him if He did. I'm telling you this morning, I'm challenging you this morning. If you're crippled this morning, you get up and you walk that aisle because you were created by Christ to do wonderful, wondrous things. Would you stand with me, please? Father, this morning we come into your house and maybe someone came in here crippled, Father. Maybe crippled relationally. Maybe crippled spiritually. Maybe crippled financially that they've done some things they shouldn't be doing and they don't know what to do to get out of it. So, Father, this morning, I pray for that soul that's crippled this morning. That says, how would he even look at me? I'm nothing but a dead dog. Father, you've placed them at your table. There's a, there's a seat for them to come sit. There's a journey for them to experience. Oh, Father, let them let go of that pew. Let them come and experience the wondrous, wonderful things you have for them. So this morning, Father, the aisle is open. I'm not even, even near it. They don't need to come to me. May they come to you. I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Here's our Savior. Let's sing together. A Savior like a shepherd.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you what you've done for us. Thank you for watching over us, taking care of us. Lord, we pray that as we have this offering, that you'd open our hearts and that we give back to you only a small portion of what you've given to us. Lord, that we do it joyfully. We thank you for that opportunity, Lord. Please watch over us through this week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning. Just a, a couple of acknowledgments. I know they don't like it, but uh, Gary Crutcher was praying at the mic, and, and James Shelton is here. And I want to thank them so much for allowing me to step away from the pulpit and then bring God's word. I, it's, it's a great sense of peace knowing you have godly men that will step up. So, James, thank you very much for doing that. I really appreciate that. So Gary out there brings a challenge every single time, and, and that's what they're supposed to do. And so I also want to say it's a blessing when people come forward because the Holy Spirit has touched them. And so this morning we have Fernando and Sylvia Casanova coming this morning. You two come. And they have Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. But they also say, I, we're going to be baptized. Not as husband and wife, but as followers in Jesus Christ who are husband and wife. Amen? Amen? Amen. Would somebody come up here and say, I want to stand by you and say, you're not going to be alone through this. We're going to walk and we're going to journey with you because now they're going to show on the outside what Jesus has been doing on the inside. And so we are going to talk and hopefully have a baptism probably next Sunday. And so you pray for them because I told them they didn't walk down here in fear. They walked down here in faith of what God's doing. So come and give them a hug and greet them. And Dr. Che, can you sing us on out of here? We just stand and have a hold your hands together, together. And I, God is here. Your presence in this place, your glory on our face, your looking to the sky. Descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now, Lord, unveil our lives. You're the reason we hear, you're the reason we sing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our prayer. You're dismissed. God will have a wonderful day.